I am here at Aqualand. We are smack dab in the middle of our Advanced Academy class and I have a special gift for all of you. I'm giving away one of our beautiful ecology courses, which is gonna give you all the information that you need to have a healthy, successful water feature. How does that sound? <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's up everybody? Ed the Pond Professor here. You can see I'm standing in front of this beautiful wall of all the regional events we built last year. The reason I bring that up is because we are a training organization. We love to teach people. We love to teach in as many ways as possible. Aquascape University, Aquascape Academies, Advanced Academies, Regional Builds, you name it, Pondemonium. We love getting people together to share our successes as well as failures because we all know that we learn from both. And in fact, we learn from our failures a lot more in a harsher condition than we do from our success. And what we're doing today is I'm teaching advanced courses right here at Aqualand. We have all of our contractors that came in from around North America to learn the latest and greatest techniques about water feature construction. But what I love about it is the scalability. And what I mean by that is I'm also going to share with you the basics of pond ecology. Ecology is a foundational science that I believe we have to build everything off of. Ever since the first day I started working at Aquascape, I have utilized my ecology experience from my uh, college degree in zoology, where I understand nature and how all these different things interact to create a symbiotic environment where nature will actually thrive. And that's exactly what we do. We bring water into any type of an environment from a backyard to massive corporate locations, as well as shopping centers around the world. And each one of those become their own little bio haven and for wildlife and I think that is becoming more and more critical in today's world when we're seeing a lot of deforestation as well as damage from all the different processes that are happening in our daily lives. So this is an opportunity for us to scale that stuff down, learn from nature, learn from our mistakes and actually come up with green infrastructure ideas where we could actually utilize that stuff to create a better environment for all of us. Hey, what's going on everybody? Ed the Pond Professor here, and I am talking to you today about my favorite subject, which is pond ecology. So this is really that science within what we do. So we design and build decorative water features, but within that kind of category, uh, pond ecology comes into play because we're creating aquatic ecosystems. So you truly have to understand how these ecosystems to function in order to figure out if they're working right for you. And I think the reason this becomes important is we've taken a lot of the guesswork out of it for you. So this was part of our R&D process many, many years ago. So we've done the learning for you. Now I wanna to try to give back because we've put everything together in such a simplistic format, you could actually get away without understanding all this stuff, which is kind of dangerous. So we want you to understand it, but I don't want you to kind of get wrapped up in it because if you try to manipulate these things on that micro scale, you're going to create more problems than it's worth. And I know this will all make sense once we go through this entire course. So we have a few different learning objectives that we're going to be hitting today. So the first thing I want to do is I want to discuss the what is an actual ecosystem. After that, I want to get into the specific water quality parameters and I know there's a big list of them but there's a few main ones that I definitely want to hit the nitrogen cycle understanding pH as well as hardness how all those different things relate to one and one another as well as how they're going to impact the actual water quality once that's done we'll be able to break down the aquascape ecosystem so you could see how all these individual pieces and parts work together to create beautiful aquatic features so what is an ecosystem an ecosystem is basically a biological community of interactive organisms and their physical environment so that's the important piece so there's lots of components to it but they all work together now I think when we talk about ecosystems I want to break it out a little bit more specifically the name of the class is actually understanding ecology pond ecology so ecology is actually the study of ecosystems where that word actually comes from is kind of broken out into two components. So eco actually is a root word is oikos, which means home. Ology is the study of a branch of science. So ecology is literally the study of the home. 
So when you think about a home, you think about its inhabitants, you think about the structure itself, the air that's part of it, the sunlight that's part of it, the actual geography, all the temperature, all these different pieces play together. So as an ecologist, you actually have to kind of be a jack of all trades. You have to understand how all these individual pieces and parts work together because you cannot study a fish without actually understanding what the fish feeds on and what feeds on it. And each one of those is going to branch off into multiple other pieces. So that's where the complexity comes into play. And that's exactly what I wanna discuss here today. So let's start out with the ecosystem pyramid itself. Now I know there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice this. You can put in complex food webs and all types of uh, energy flows and things like that. But again, this is a basic ecology course. So I wanna start out with this base level understanding so at the base of it all is going to be water itself. So that's actually the home for the specific ecosystem. And what I think is interesting about water, um, the H2O molecule, um, it is the most incredible compound on planet Earth. If you look at our globe, you're going to see an abundance of blue. That's because we are an aquatic based planet. So it is dominated by water. And what we design and build though more specifically is fresh water. So we're not going to get into talking about the oceans and all that type of stuff. So we're going to talk specifically about fresh water. Now fresh water is going to add is going to be added into our ecosystems obviously with precipitation. We typically fill them with groundwater and city water and things like that. And that's kind of where I, what I really want to touch upon is that base level of water is very very unique and there are going to be specific properties at different locations throughout North America that will actually impact the water quality. So having an understanding of that, that, that raw water source is very important. And some of those things that we have to think about are gonna be the pH and gonna be the hardness, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. The next layer I wanna discuss after the base le level of water is going to be that first level. So that first level in this pyramid is going to be the bacteria, the phytoplankton, uh, the protozoa, aquatic plants, and the fungi that are actually recycling Cycling all those nutrients. So you're gonna have a lot of different things that are happening down in that layer. So the reason it's at the bottom of the pyramid is because that wide section actually has a huge amount of biomass. You may not think about it, but the majority of the nutrients and the, uh, the majority of the life that's actually occurring is gonna be on that base level because as it goes up towards the pyramid, you cannot have a lot of um, large predators um, overwhelming a system because there's not gonna be enough food in it to actually sustain the ecosystem. There Therefore, you actually have to have the widest area in the bottom, and then it's gonna slowly taper its way up as you go from the first level all the way up to the sixth level. Now that next layer up, that zooplankton layer, which is what, what we marked off here as the second level, um, these are those animals that are responsible for taking that initial production. So they're gonna take the phytoplankton that was actually produced through the process of photosynthesis. They're gonna turn that carbohydrate into an actual protein, and then it's gonna be able to move up through the ecosystem. And I think that's really the important piece that I want to discuss here is there's actually a cycling. It starts on the bottom, you have the raw nutrients, they're going to be recycled through the bacteria and the microorganisms. They're going to turn that into a food source, which will then go to the primary production. Primary production goes into the secondary and then so on. So the small stuff actually gets eaten by bigger and bigger organisms as you go up that pyramid. And that's really what I, what I want to focus on here today. So when we talk about the big picture of an ecosystem, it's really, really important because that's actually going to give us clean water, oxygen, food, and all the different raw materials that we have available to us. Now, as pond builders, what does that mean for us? It means we're going to have a healthy aquatic environment. So when we have a healthy ecosystem, it means all the plants, the fish, and all the different microorganisms are going to live symbiotically together, and we're going to get the clean, clear water we're looking for. We're going to get a healthy environment for those beautiful fish that we all strive to have. We're also going to have the different types of plants and organisms living inside of this aquatic ecosystem. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes as I break apart the individual components of the aquascape ecosystem. So the nitrogen cycle is probably one of the most important uh, cycles that's happening in our ecosystems. And I'm going to say probably because they're all really important. The water cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the pH scale, the hardness, all these different things. But the nitrogen cycle specifically is definitely well documented and well discussed on a lot of different forums around the world. And the reason being is this system actually is what's going to keep your fish alive. So when we have an aquatic ecosystem, 
ecosystem. When we have that, that pond environment and we want to have different species of fish living inside of it, you have to have that appropriate nitrogen cycle in order for everything to function properly. But basically what that nitrogen cycle is, is it's this really complex biochemical engine. It's really amazing, but it's really broken down. It's controlled by different species of bacteria. Again, we take these things for granted. They're in and around this on a daily basis and they just do their job for us. But sometimes when something goes wrong, the entire ecosystem will crash, which is really why you have to have an, uh, a good understanding of the basics of how this system actually works. So the nitrogen cycle itself is very cyclical, and that's exactly what we've shown here on this, on this current slide. So let's start out right here in the middle part with ammonia. The reason we're going to start out with ammonia because that's actually the waste product that's created by fish and other organisms living inside of the aquatic environment. So through the metabolic processes, as they feed on protein, protein is made up of amino acids. As amino acids are broken down, the resulting uh, waste product is actually called ammonia. And that's what we have here. Ammonia is actually very, very toxic. So it will actually kill your fish and different inhabitants pretty quickly. So what we wanna do is take that ammonia and we wanna drop it down through this cycle and we wanna start to detoxify it. All that is happening through different strains of bacteria that are gonna be added into the pond. Now, I always recommend the addition of different species of uh, beneficial bacteria and microorganisms in every ecosystem that you create because it's gonna to help to jumpstart the system for us. So they're gonna to start to break down all that stuff that's inside of the water. So what's gonna happen? We're gonna go from ammonia, which is secreted by the fish. Bacteria are gonna to start to break it down and feed on it. They're gonna turn that ammonia into nitrite. Nitrite is not as dangerous as ammonia, but it's still, if it's brought up in high levels, can become toxic to the inhabitants. Another layer of bacteria is going to be, get involved and they're going to take nitrite and they're gonna turn it into nitrate. Now, the unique thing about nitrate, again, it's much less toxic than ammonia and nitrite combined, but it can still get elevated and can cause problems for your aquatic ecosystem. So what we want to do is we want to have green plants. We want to have algae. We also want to take some of that uh, nitrate through, the, through an anaerobic process and turn it back into nitrogen gas, which we actually breathe. So it's going to go back up into the atmosphere. It's going to turn it back into that, uh, that inert nitrogen gas. So as you can see, this is a really nice cycle that actually starts with our fish food. So you're going to feed your fish. And it's going to jumpstart the entire ecosystem. If it's left unchecked, that's when you could have problems. Now, the other thing that I want to I want to discuss here is some of this stuff down here in the bottom, um, death and waste. So, as the fish waste builds up, as you have leaf debris coming into the pond, as those decompose, they're actually going to add a additional ammonia to the pond. This is why it's important to understand the cycles of all these different things. You want to be able to remove that stuff and really understand it. And the reason I'm saying it is we're in a time of the year right now where we have leaf debris coming down. So when you have leaf debris building up in the, in the uh, aquatic system, if it's left unchecked, it could cause problems and it's going to increase the ammonia and it's going to throw this entire cycle out of balance. In a naturally occurring system, once you go through that first month of operation, everything should function as designed and the ecosystem should flow and all these bacteria and microorganisms are going to work symbiotically together to create a healthy, clean environment for all the pond inhabitants. The next cycle that we want to hit is pH. And again, this is one I think people have a little bit of an understanding, but I don't know if they do or not because it can be kind of complex. And I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about here. So pH is actually on a scale. Um, what's interesting about it is it starts in the middle at seven. So seven is actually neutral. If you go down towards zero, that means it's getting more acidic. If you go higher than seven, it actually becomes more alkaline. So what's happening actually with this, uh, this pH scale is it's an understanding of hydrogen in the water. So when we have high hydrogen ions in our, in our aquatic ecosystems, it means that it's gonna be more acidic. And when we have a higher mixture of hydroxyl ions in the water, it means it's gonna be more alkaline. So the pH is basically an understanding of the hydrogen ions versus the hydroxyl. When they're both equal to one another, that's neutral water. 
So that's gonna be pure water, which is very, very difficult to find and it's not gonna last that long. So most of the aquatic ecosystems that we design and build are gonna be kind of in this middle range. They're gonna be kind of over in here somewhere. Again, you can always go above or below these things, but once you start getting above these, I mean, if you start reading some of the stuff that's actually on here, it's pretty impressive. So once you start getting to a pH of 11, that's, that's basically like ammonia. So it's very, very toxic. And the same thing over here, once you get down to a three, you're gonna be down, uh, uh, down at the pH of, uh, of an acidic uh, drink, such as orange juice or, um, or soft drinks and things like that. I actually was in the Amazon um, in the, in the, on the Rio Negro River, and we were actually reading a, a pH in the low fours, which is just incredible to me. I didn't even think that was gonna be possible, but, but I saw it firsthand. These animals actually have designed over many, many millennia to live in this incredible aquatic environment. And again, this is an incredible scale that's actually occurring. And what I think is interesting about this is gonna be this next slide. So this is really where it kind of pulls all these different pieces and parts together. So here again, we're gonna start out at that neutral component. Um, what I think is interesting about this, you know, when you just say your pH went for, from a six to a seven, most people would probably hear that and be like, oh my gosh, from a six to a seven, what is that? That's nothing. Or a six to a five, sorry, let's go the other direction. More acidic, from a six to a five. So doesn't sound like much, but that's actually an incredible increase in the amount of hydrogen ions. That's actually a tenfold increase. You went from uh, basically 10 to 100 times more acidic than that neutral situation. So that's 100 times more acidic than neutral water. When you go all the way here to a pH of zero, it's actually 10 million times more acidic. So it really throws it off. So when you just say it's a scale from, uh, when it goes from seven down to zero, it doesn't sound like much, but that it's just an unbelievable increase. It's a logarithmic scale. So it actually just increases by that number of 10 each time. And then the opposite is true as you go more alkaline. So when you go from that neutral, from a pH of seven to eight, that eight is basically 10 times the difference. So I think that's where people get thrown off with it. And the other thing that I wanna stress here with pH is people are gonna to start to freak out about it. pH is cyclical. It's gonna change actually throughout the day. You're gonna have cycles of pH going up and down because during the day, you're gonna have um, more consumption or production of uh, a photosynthesis. They're gonna produce oxygen in the water. Um, and then at night, you're gonna have the exact opposite. You're gonna have consumption of all these resources. So there's gonna be a change in the pH. It's not gonna be huge, but you should see a slight change throughout the day. So this is part of the normal cycle. Now, when you have very hard water, that actually stabilizes everything. So I think what's interesting about this is when we have an aquatic environment that's closed, we're designing and building a, a closed ecosystem. Through the metabolic processes of us feeding our fish, uh, the fish waste being broken down, this is actually produces um, acids. Those acids actually are going to slowly acidify the water. This is why having a slightly higher pH, having slightly higher carbonate hardness in the water actually becomes more important. So when people say they have hard water, sometimes actually that can be a good thing to an extent, and I'll break that out here in a second. Um, but what I think is interesting is understanding the different relationships of all of them. If you're gonna start checking your pH, check it at the same exact time, because if you're off, early morning versus early evening, you're gonna get two completely different readings. And when you come to an aquatic environment, consistency is key. So once you start checking something, you wanna do it at the exact same time. And I don't want you to get wrapped up with anything. I don't want you being, uh, going out there and being stuck to, uh, checking your pH on a daily basis because nature should manage it for you. And if you have a good understanding of a, of a working system in your geographic area, you're gonna kind of know the cycles that are actually occurring in your community. So certain areas have harder water than others. This is gonna be a little bit more stable and I'll break that out in a second. But understanding the pH, I typically don't check it unless I actually see problems, unless you're having issues with your fish, unless you're seeing any problems. It's one of those things we have to understand. We have to know what they, they actually mean, but we don't wanna manipulate it on that level at this point unless you're seeing problems.